Jimmy Recor, I'm the moderator, and I'm going to call this meeting open. First of all, it's nice to see all of you. It's nice to see all of your faces. Okay, we got a little bit of business to do, about six million dollars worth of business to do. We're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. We just got some new things to talk about. First of all, we're going to be voting electronically, which I'm sure you're all aware of since you came through check-in. It's a pretty simple clicker. We're going to ask a question. When a, when a motion's on, you're going to vote yes or no. You can press the button however many times you want to. It's only going to record the last thing you press, yes or no, during the time period. The time period will not be like two minutes for each question. We can keep real-time tabulations right here on this machine. And when we see we're almost there, I, I will start things by saying, you know, voting is over. If, as soon as it comes that we realize most people have voted, I'll say five seconds or ten seconds, voting will be closed. It comes that easy. And just please remember to turn these in at the end. Because if you take it home and try to use it next meeting, it won't work. So. <laughs> so, that's that. I know it's been a long pandemic, and we're coming out of the other side of it, and some of us have suffered in that pandemic a little bit. Um, today, I would hope we can be kind to each other in this meeting and get through it the best we can. We're all here because we care about this town, and this is the last true form of democracy. Somebody can put their hand up here and change things and make a vote pass that may have not to. And that's, that's a very cool thing in this world. So I'm trusting we can act accordingly. Is there anyone who who does not have a clicker, who's a registered voter, who came through there, and everybody got one. Town clerk's interested in that. Yep. Okay. Starting right on. Okay, we're gonna do a test first. I'm gonna ask a question. Do you think electronic voting do you trust electronic voting? Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, voting is open. Voting closes in 10 seconds. Voting is closed. We have 89 yeses, 10 noes for total 99. I guess it works for now. Okay. Article 1. Here are the reports of the selectmen, town treasurer, town clerk, school committee, tax collector, board of health, and any committee and act thereon. So I move that the town meeting pass over the Article 1. We have a motion to pass over the article. Do I have a second? 
Any discussion? Voting is open. Voting's closing in 10 seconds. Voting's closed. Motion passes 89 to 4. Article 2. I move that the town approve section A of Article 2 as presented in the warrant for a subtotal of $2,652,000, $6,652,000, $6,652,000, Can I hold that motion without a second? Because I believe the Finance Committee, do you, do you want to present Hi everyone, my name is Alan Singer. I chair the uh, Finance Committee and I live on Warrenville Road in Conway. And we're given a uh, Finance Committee and Capital Improvements Committee. Uh, well, so if you have it, go over the uh, first page of Street Cash. It's a, uh, it's a mountain chart, graph bar graph chart, and uh, You'll notice that we estimate about $36,500 of free cash based on the budget as we present today. That is historically lower. And I will comment that uh, there are some things impacting that. Uh, not so much property tax collection. Our town treasurer's done a very good job collecting money. We're about 98% collected, I think. Yeah. Uh, actually, okay. So we're on track, thank goodness. That was a big concern. But the RMV, our excise tax, is down slightly. A lot of that's the result of the pandemic, and we are projecting that to rebound for the fiscal year 22. So in other words, free cash should improve at $36,500. Uh, there are some also uh, budgets for fiscal year 21, uh, namely the uh, snow and ice removal, where only about 50, about 60 percent of budget. And so there'll be, I think that the free cash figure will increase. Another uh, unknown at this point in terms of the timing and amount. Look at it. People are waving the, uh, their hands because they can't hear you. Would somebody recognize that, please? Get okay, your sorry. Okay. Get a okay. car or an inch from the microphone. All right. Can you hear me better now? Sorry. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So anyway, in terms of the uh, free cash, another uh, factor which could weigh heavily is that uh, the federal stimulus package to uh, cities and towns, which is yet to be finalized, has not been factored into our budget. And that will definitely uh, come. Yeah, as I said before, the timing amount as of yet is uncertain. And we have not factored that in for the fiscal year 22 budget. Are there any questions about free cash? You know, it's a, uh, something which is certified every year, by the way, through the state, the Department of Revenue, the Department of Local Service. It's usually done sometime around the end of September, October. 
for fiscal year 21, there were delays because of the pandemic. Any questions? Second page of the slide of the, of the uh, stabilization funds in Conway. We have four. They are the uh, general stabilization fund, the capital stabilization fund, the, the, uh, and the Conway Grammar School uh, stabilization fund. We had a, a fifth fund, which is no longer, which was the highway garage stabilization fund, which was spent to zero and is now closed. Questions? Oh, thank you. OPEP. OPEP is uh, other post-employment benefit, post-retirement benefits, namely health insurance that we are required to pay contractually to town employees you know, upon their retirement thereafter. And we do lay every year about $20,000, which according to our auditors, uh, who are uh, Roselli and Clark, every other year our town has its uh, finances audited by an outside agency, Roselli and Clark. And uh, that we're putting money aside to OPEP as a small town is actually a sign of very good fiscal strength that we're doing that and have been doing that for a number of years. Thank you for asking. What does ATM stand for? Oh, annual town meeting. Next up on the next slide is the uh, Town of Conway fiscal year 22 expenses. You'll see the schools, between the schools and highway department, we take up about 70% of the budget, and that's quite typical for a town, regardless of size. And uh, not surprisingly, of the uh, individual line items that make up the budget for both the highway department and the, and the, and the schools, salaries and the benefits are the largest individual line item component. As a service-based business, you can probably imagine that. Any questions on that? Thank you. The next uh, page slide, projected debt payments. As you see, one of the articles that was uh, mailed out, you see, is the uh, borrowing of money for the uh, improvement of Shelburne Falls Road, $170,000. We continue to repay the debt on the uh, highway garage improvement, which for the fiscal year 22 will be total debt. We'll pay on the highway garage about $117,000. And we're projecting that if we were to borrow money for the uh, Shelburne Falls Road paving, which is estimated at $170,000, that uh, we will be taking a uh, on more debt. But you know, as a general rule, we haven't borrowed a lot of money in the historically in this town, and as a percentage of overall budget, at $159,000, $160,000 for fiscal year 22 for the uh, if we were to borrow money for including the uh, Shelburne Falls Road as a percentage of our budget is still quite small. And uh, the finance committee, our town treasurer, the select board, we feel that with the low interest rate environment that's projected to continue, that it's a good idea now to borrow money. The uh, nature of the timing and how we're going to do that, we have yet to determine, but we'll uh, rely on our treasurer and her advisors in terms of what, what's the best option. Any questions? Following page slide, you can see that we have been paying down on our debt. Of course, that's going to change, but uh, you know, I think that it's capital improvements. We haven't done a huge amount of, uh, of improvements in our town in terms of uh, prior to the highway garage, and so that reflects it, but uh, it's, we have, these are things that have to get done. And uh, we've been very, very, very fortunate to have a low interest rate environment. I'll turn the mic over to our select board chair, Bob Armstrong. So looking at this slide, I'm actually chair of the Capital Improvements Committee. Uh, uh, so, so we wanted to put a slide in here just to give you a feel for what we've spent on capital improvements in the past, especially for these vehicles, and then what the vehicles are that we see coming up. And this is a, a thing that gets changed every year as we come to town meeting and ask you for money to buy some new vehicles and you turn it down. So, uh, so, so you'll see under uh, fiscal year 22, 
Um, we're just we're, we're just asking for one vehicle. Uh, it's the remaining $220,000 heavy-duty truck, and we'll get there eventually in the money. Um, you, you may remember, and we say this every year, when uh, when Ron came to be uh, to run our highway department, he really believed that the uh, that the uh, emissions in all of these heavy-duty trucks didn't work very well. And so he said he'd really recommend we keep our old trucks running for a lot longer than normal until they figure out how to make diesel emissions work well. Well, we finally got to where he thinks they work well, so we've been buying new trucks. I hate to say that we've been buying them every year, but that's what it came down to. We have old trucks that don't run very well. And this is the last one of those heavy-duty trucks that we need to buy. Uh, and, then, and then, so next year, we'll be looking for a new grader. Uh, that's the, the big spend for next year. Uh, and then the next year, in 2024, we have some vehicles that you guys pushed off from a couple of years ago, and we're hoping to, that you'll eventually let us buy a new plow and that you'll, uh, that, that you'll allow the town to buy a, a new, what's called a track loader. And then, and then it goes on. You can look from year to year. Those vehicles in 2025, two of them are also vehicles that you pushed off from the last few years. So we're trying to catch up. Uh, these are the vehicles that are com coming along in the future. So. Sure. What are the little red squares thing? I don't know. It's something XL put in there. I'm not really sure. I, and I couldn't figure out how to get XL to remove them. You, you got me. <laughs> no, it's nothing, nothing secret that I know of. On the, next, on the next page, if you want to look through, I just sort of created a little historical perspective on what we're asking for this year, what we passed last year, and what we didn't pass last year, and then the same thing for the previous years before that, the vehicles that we bought, the vehicles that we did not buy. And one of the things you can get out of this, if you look at this, you'll see that a few years ago, we were asking for a vehicle and it would have only cost, let's say, $30,000 or something, and now it's $50,000 because the trade-in value is not as high as it would have been and the price of these go up every year. So, you know, what we, what we believe is that when we ask for these vehicles, we really need them, and you have the prerogative of saying, let's hold off a little while. Uh, a while ago we started, Ron tried to convince the town that if we trade in some of the standard equipment after five years, when it still has a high value for contractors and they, they would buy it in a used market and he could get a good price, that it would be a good idea for us to trade them in and to buy new. And so far the town has not agreed with Ron on that, that view. And you know, they, they want the town to treat vehicles probably like you do, and I can tell you like I do, I drive my cars into the ground. And that may work for all of us, but it doesn't work for Ron when he needs to get the roads plowed. So it is good to get some of these vehicles upgraded on a regular basis. So, but this is, this is the decision that we all get to make here as a town. Okay. So we wanted to do this little slide presentation just to start off to try to answer some of the questions that everybody always asks. So these were just some things that have been going on lately. Um, so as you know, our town administrator, Tom Hutchinson, left Conway and he's now working up in Dalton. And, uh, and you know, we, we miss Tom a lot. Uh, you know, as selectmen, we thought he was doing a very good job, but there were people in town who didn't like some of the ways that he ran the town. And uh, that always happens. Uh, we were very fortunate to hire uh, Ross Perry, who's sitting over right next to Jenny, um, who, who was a, the town administrator in Sterling and retired and was looking to try out an, an interim position and he came to Conway and he's been pretty wonderful. Bob, Bob, you have a question in the back. Sure. Yeah, Bob. 
since you're the owner of an electric vehicle, as I am, when is the trucks going to electric vehicles? When, I don't see anything on here until past 2031. Is that what we're talking about? We'll keep working on rock. Okay. That's the I think that the trucks will get here. You know, we're barely doing pickup trucks right now. There aren't any real heavy-duty trucks. I think there'll be semi-trailers and, you know, for driving on the highway. But these real heavy-duty uh, graders and excavators, they'll be a while. But I hope we get there. Uh, and then, so, so, so we hired Ross as our interim administrator. I don't know if you've met him. You should come up after town meeting and say hello. Um, pretty much everybody that's met him and had dealings with him has we're really pleased with our decision to hire him as our interim. And following the interim, then we had to go through the hiring process to hire the full-time town administrator. And you may have read in Conway Currents or in our town website, but we've hired Veronique Blanchard, who many people in town know, and she's here in the meeting somewhere. She's back in the corner hiding. Uh, uh, there she is. Here, here. And so she will become the Conway. Thank, thank you, Bernie. She'll become the Conway Town Administrator the end of June. Uh, I forget the exact day. The 28th. So that's a joke. Uh, we'll, we'll have a little passing of the baton ceremony over to Bernie. Okay. Okay. We we have a uh, standing motion on the floor to move Section A of Article 2. Uh, gets moved as a, a Section A, just Section A of Article 2, presented on the warrant for a subtotal of $2,652,425. I believe that they'd get a second also, right? So we've got a motion and second on the floor. Any discussion? Where do you see that two million figure on this thing? It's not on there. I just I read it as the motion. Oh, okay. Rather than have people worry about how to add them all up, we just we just wanted to give you an idea of what percentage this is of the town budget. Can you explain the ones that changed a whole lot, like this? You know, something that goes up twelve thousand dollars or goes from a big amount to. to that was 17,000. Do you, do you want to, let's, let's do it this way. Malcolm, to answer your question, we're, instead of passing all of Article 2, Bob, motion that we could do just Section A of Article 2, so lines 114 <laughs> through 900. And what, I guess what we're asking now is, are there any questions? If, if you have a question about a number and any of those lines, tell us what the article is and we'll talk about it. So we, we have a question about 141. Can, can you just clarify for the audience which column we're voting on? Part A. Everything in part A. Yeah, but which column? Oh, oh. Second from the right. So, 22. And 422 went up. So, I'm Or maybe why 900 went down. Or one night here to talk to you. I think that was a question somebody else had. You're asking about 422? 142. I can answer 900. So 900 is because our health insurance rate went down this year. Very unusual, but we're very happy about that. We participate in the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust, and 
They are great at keeping our rates down. Okay, 141. Assessor's salary. I'm having a problem um, being in touch with the assessors, and I'm wondering why they want to increase in salary when our office isn't even open for the next month, and we can't have any access to information. So, so the, the increase is to hire, uh, as you know, or you may know, Lee is retiring. And so we're in the process of looking for an interim person to come in as a trainee. And so we've hired a part-time person to come in and, you know, learn about Conway's system for doing assessments. So, so that's what that 12000 is. Oh, it, okay. Because it, it said just salaries. And right. Right. So, so Ron, do you want to talk to that? Great. So 192 is um, building and maintenance, and we have a, a janitor uh, employee right now that is retiring in September. So I just I talked to the select board about making that. It's already a um, part-time benefited position, so it makes sense to make that a full-time position part. Highway Park Building and Maintenance, so that we can have get more things done in the to the buildings and also help out the highway department when work is slow for the building and maintenance. So the difference is minus seventeen thousand eight hundred thirty-three out of the building maintenance, but that's also um, four twenty-two salaries. That's why that increase is $44,092, is because that's going to pay for a full-time position. Thank you. OK, Malcolm. We'll get to you, Hank. Thanks. My name's Hank Horstman. Uh, the only question I've got is, I hear, as far as the uh, vehicles and such, is trade them in? Is, does anybody ever look at and sell them to the world instead of trading them in? In other words, put them on the internet. Where are you going to get the most money? That's what I'm, Did anybody ever look at that? Rod, do you want to talk to that? Uh, are we talking to that or are we talking to this car? Are we jumping all over the place here? Well, we're not really... Hank, Hank, we'll get back to you. Okay. Mel? Yeah, I uh, have a few words to say and then not anything of encouragement. Because I took the project of having the steeple plated in the front of the town hall, and that was taken out of my hands and handed to our old boss, and it was never completed. The front doors have never been painted. The cornice on the right hand side of the plane, and the contractor drove across the sidewalk without any protection and broke the sidewalk up. So, very soon in the near future, that's going to have to be repaired, and the contractor should be held responsible for that. And it never was done. So, that's, that's my pitch, and you know, I think it's legitimate. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Are there any other questions on specific lines in Section A of Article 2? I'm opening the vote on Section A, Article 2. Should I read the motion again? Okay. I move that the town approve Section A of Article 2 as presented in the warrant for a subtotal of $2,652,425. Okay, I Does everybody understand?
Mary? right under the 715,000 uh, figure as the subtotal of the whole section. It's very confusing to hear numbers that we don't see on the page. Yeah. So please clarify if you're giving a subtotal where it goes on the page. Thank you. Yes. You are absolutely correct in that. It should be the subtotal under the 900 line. Should be, that should be uh, 2,652,425. And I, I agree with you. It is confusing that it's not on the warrant in the place it should be. And there's just a total on the warrant. But we'll get through this. The vote is open, yes, the vote is open. Voting will close in 10 seconds. Voting is closed. Motion passes uh, 103 to 11. Okay, part B. So we're, this is going to be the same kind of subtotal that we just did, but it's only for these two items down in Part B. I move that the town approve Section B of Article 2 as presented in the warrant for a subtotal of $2,026,243. Motion and second on the floor. And the only two lines of the budget that this pertains to are 300A and 300B. And those would be the grammar school operating and grammar school transportation. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Voting is open. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Excuse me. Sorry. Any discussion? Mr. Moderator, move that uh, non-resident speakers be acknowledged. It may be uh, Principal Kristen Gordon, Director of Business Administration, Shelley Perega, and Superintendent of Schools, Darius Modesto. Do I have a second on a motion to allow them to speak? We're good on that. So, any questions? 300A, 300B. Why did why the total go up this year? Just discuss it. Again, Darius Modesto, the superintendent of schools. Um, the uh, the two major uh, portions of the outside of regular growth of the you know two percent coal increases and such. Um, we, are, we are looking to put in a new intervention teacher, and we also have about $10,000 worth of increase in summer program and technology expenses. Um, so those are the two driving forces of the kind of the larger number that you kind of usually see uh, within the elementary school. If there's any more specific questions on the intervention teacher, I can have Christy Gordon, the principal, to discuss that. Any other questions? Or three, 300A or 300B? Um, 
I see a lot of uh, big yellow school buses going by my house either way, which have uh, very few students in them. And, you know, these are Freightliner diesel uh, buses, I guess. And I'm wondering why they use such uh, large transportation vehicles for the diminishing number of students that they have to carry. Well, actually, this year we actually reduced the number of lines because of COVID um, within transportation. But the question has to do with busing in general. Why are we using larger buses on some of these back roads and such? So basically how contracting works for bus companies is we put a contract out and we get bidders and how they're going to do their lines. Um, if we're going to do specific bus sizes that the contractor has to use, or if you want to use electric buses or that kind of stuff, you're going to change your bid rate tremendously. And of the bid rate that we got, we are far better than any other bid in Franklin County, um, and far lower than any other bid in Franklin County, um, that, I mean, the transportation costs that we have in our district. So um, one of our buses right now is at capacity. Um, the other one is less. The other problem with Conway is you guys got a lot of roads and a lot of people spread out. So we have to, we have to send buses. You actually have three runs and less students in towns that actually have two runs of buses. Because the amount of different, we have to send people in three different directions that, um, the, mile, the amount of miles that we have to put on those buses. Um, the other side note of that is unless you want to increase rider time to have kids on the bus for over 45 minutes, which, which we try to keep kids under, you know, one and an hour and a half bus ride, we can use less buses and pack those kids in further. And then, you know, the environment versus well-being, there's a balance there. So, kind of it's a loaded question, but there's a lot of different moving parts to it. Is it not a law that you have to have enough capacity of buses? So if there was a need to evacuate the whole school, that you would have the capacity enough in a bus to do that? Am I correct? Yes, we have actually had to evacuate schools, unfortunately, in the years I've been here. Um, Ripco is on, on standby. He has a staff down in his garage, and they're all certified bus drivers, and they can be here in about 10 minutes or so. The distance is from the center of Deerfield up here with buses. Um, we actually, unfortunately, had to do that we, we, a few years ago. When a, a, a rail liner went off with chemicals. Um, we had to evacuate immediately, and we were able to do that within 20 minutes because the kids out of the school. So. Um, we have that option available to us. Great question, Malcolm. Uh, just a point of order, Jimmy, could you ask people to identify sure. themselves? Who are you? <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Peter Jaswal, Low Cricket Hill Road. Okay, please identify, please, when you raise your hand, wait for a microphone because we can't hear you. And state who you are, please. Robert Baker, 112 Elm Street. I'm new in town, I just moved here the other day. <laughs> uh, to go on to Malcolm's question about the buses, we did have to evacuate our school here two, about two years ago due to a chemical smell in the building and Kripko's buses arrived and transported every one of our kids and the teachers to Frontier Regional to really get the problem straightened out. And I think that was a great thing. Thank you. Stein, Pike, Shelburne Falls Road, is it possible for me to move the question? Yeah. I so do. Is the motion to move the question? Second. I got a second. Any discussion? <coughs> That's right. There's no discussion. That's true. Okay. We're going to move the question. We have to vote on it. Yes. Voting. Waiting for the technical assistance. <laughs> Voting is open.
It's open. This is for moving the question, correct? Right. Right. Voting's closed, 10 seconds. Okay, uh, question's been moved, uh, 97-80. Read the motion again. Thank you. I move that the town approve section B of Article 2 as presented in the warrant for a subtotal of $2,026,243. Second. We have motion to second. Any discussion? No. We know about it. <laughs> Voting is open. Ten seconds. Okay, the motion passes one hundred and ten to five. So now we'll vote on part C. I move that the town approve section C of Article Two as presented in the warrant for a subtotal of $1,518,797. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And these are for lines 892A and 892B. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, let's vote. Voting is over. Ten seconds. Voting is closed. Motion passes one twelve to three. And so now the same kind of motion for the technical schools, Part D. I move the town approve Section D of Article 2 as presented in the warrant for a subtotal of $146,711. There's a motion and second on the floor. These pertain to lines 320A and 320B on your warrant. Any discussion? I'm Tiana Vegas on Minghorn Road. I just wanted to hear that that's the full amount that's being asked for the technical school. That, that, 
the, that this amount here is meeting the request for our students in town. The select board says yes. Everybody ready to vote? We, we do have reps from the tech schools that can speak to it if you'd like to hear from them. Voting's open. Seconds. Okay, motion passes one eleven to three. So now we're going to move on to Article Three. I move that the town transfer 71000 from the Conway School Capitalization, Capital Stabilization Fund to the General Fund for Capital Expenses of the Conway Grammar School. And this requires a two-thirds vote. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor to uh, have the town transfer 71000 from the Conway Grammar School Capitalization Fund to the General Fund for Capital Expenses of the Conway Grammar School. Any discussion? Mary McClintock. You beat me to it. I didn't get to say I'm Mary McClintock and I live right down there. Um, so, um, so, what did we spend capital expenses of $71,000 for? So this is actually a good one. So basically, within our capital expenses, a school can be put forward for eighteen thousand dollars. Right now, we are renovating the, uh, redoing the floors in each of the classrooms, moving from carpet to a um, plank flooring with um, regular rugs that can be you know, rotated out on a more frequent basis for um, for sanitary purposes. Also included in this is a generator. So this is the loaded question, um, the loaded kind of common knowledge, kind of be blunt about it. The actual, in the transition of power of the uh, town administrators, the actual correct amount did not go through. It should be $78,000, because the $18,000, $60,000 for the generator equals seventy eight. dollars However, the school can modify just to two classrooms this year. Um, if we talked internally, we could do that. We're actually behind on the library project due to COVID and the flooring in there, so it'll actually work out. The $60,000 for the generator, the way I'm looking at it is this, this is not something the school is asking for. It is great to have it. Um, it protects your building. But this is more for the emergency center. I don't know if any emergency personnel want to talk to it. But we, we currently have a generator here. It's hard finding parts for it. And if your generator breaks down, we may not be able to repair it. Um, so the school is actually in this particular role. Is it working as your, you could fund any of the departments that would be connected to the generator to pay for it. It's just easier, I would think, or easiest to go through the school as the funding body since we would oversee it. We oversee the maintenance of it right now. It's in our building. Um, we do the annual turn-ons and checks of it and that kind of stuff. So, but the generator really is not about the operations, not for the children. Um, but on those kind of days where we have that kind of weather, there's, we probably aren't having kids in school. It's for this to be an emergency shelter. It's for this to be, to have heat, if we had prolonged um, outages to protect the building from freezing pipes and other issues of that sort. And given the weather up in Conway, you guys do need an um, emergency center. Um, it's just the way it is, the new weather coming through this, this area. So um, I imagine other people can answer questions on the generator, but the current one is working. Um, however, with each repair, we're finding it more and more difficult. It's not very efficient. It's an old, I don't know the model of it, um, but it's an older generator.
I'm Steve Thomas. Uh, uh, Mary answered my primary question about how you're going to spend these things. Um, I'm a little concerned about the frequency with which uh, the highway department and you and your generator are turning over equipment. You know, I have a lot of equipment. I, this stuff goes forever, and uh, this business about having trouble getting parts. Um, you know, I don't know the details of that, but that's always used as an excuse. Um, um, you know, generators aren't cheap, but uh, I'm wondering whether there's too much hustling, I not use it, hustling and turning over equipment. I remember last year there was a fellow that came up after conversations about, you know, getting a new truck. And he knew, I don't know much about trucks, having a new truck. He said that the truck that they were going to turn over and pay whatever, a quarter million dollars for a new one um, was just a baby and that he, in his business, would never, you know, turn over a truck that frequently. So um, I don't expect you to be able to address this question, but turning over equipment before um, its service life has uh, expired has been a concern to me around here. George? Uh, George Murphy, I'm an EMD. Uh, I don't know how old that generator is, but I know the company that made it went out of business 20 years ago. That makes it pretty old, and they haven't made parts for 20 years. So we really are at risk. Uh, on Darius's comment that they don't really need it, that generator was put in the school long before we had emergency management, before the state wanted us to have a shelter. That was put in here to support the school and no other reason. I talked to people in this building, people at Union 38. They are very anxious to get it replaced to protect frozen food, to protect the pipes. And in the case where there is a disaster, and maybe the road between here and Gripos is closed, we should be able to take care of the kids, and having electricity really helps with that. Joe? The generator, if it's the original, was put in in 1990 when we opened the school. Yeah. Malcolm? I'm terribly concerned about what's the criteria for changing this equipment. You know, I was equipment superintendent for one of the largest contractors in the world for 20 years, and I traveled the world with them. We had certain criteria we had to meet before we dumped a piece of equipment. The first one was to take oil samples, which will tell you how much life was left in the engine. And I don't think that's happening with these trucks. I don't think they have that kind of a maintenance program. The generator, I'd say, uh, change it, because it's an important piece of equipment. And I'm sure it starts once a month or once a week, like mine does, and uh, very important. So I have no problem with generator. I do have a problem with some of the other equipment. Thank you very much. Oh, I forgot I forgot to tell you, it's Malcolm Force. I live on 288 Truce Road. And I was born in Conway 88 years ago. <laughs> Mary? Uh, I really appreciate hearing people's opinions about repairing trucks or replacing trucks, and I hope they would hold those conversations when we are actually talking about repairing or replacing trucks. And I would ask to we move this question now. Yeah. Motion and a second to move the question. I'm waiting. The, the reason there's a d delay in this, when we have an amendment, it has to get typed in to the computer so it knows what we're voting for. And that's why we have this little space now. We're all set. So, voting is over. Voting on moving the question. Five seconds.
Okay, the motion passed 109 to 5. Now we're going to vote on Article 3. Voting is open. Ten seconds. Jim Moore, Main Street. Um, does that thirty-four thousand get subtracted from the seventy-one thousand, or, or vice versa? Uh, it, it sounds like those two items are related. Uh, just an explanation. We often put money into stabilization funds shortly after we have spent money from those stabilization funds. Additionally, the. The grammar school stabilization fund was set up by the school committee with the goal of having sufficient funds to pay for the worst case scenario boiler situation because the boilers are also original to the building and have also are also past their due by date um, but they're still functioning and we're not going to replace them until they stop functioning but we stabilization fund uh, only needed to get refilled to get us we, there's a target I believe the target is 250, uh, 250,000. And so that there's a difference, but we were slightly above that. Now we're just getting back to that. So any other questions? Any other discussion? Article 4? I'm open and voting. Ten seconds. Our force pass hundred and five to three. Second, any discussion or explanation? Sure. 
what, what happened here is that the, um, the school committee had voted to put up $200,000 aside for the overage in the track and it ended up being, when we put the track out the bid, they thought the bid was going to come up, up to one hundred fifty to $200,000 higher than what we originally estimated. And so we took our EMD and voted to use it in that way. We did the bidding this spring and it came in basically at, at $8,000 over instead of $150,000 over, which the concern was of the materials and so on and so forth was a moving target. So the school committee then um, said, you know, we should be um, assessing the towns for this when we have this free money to, to use it in this way for the capital. So basically the school committee voted to with, with, withdraw that and pay for that money with the excess from what they had put aside for the track. Any other question or discussion? Article 5? Wait for the mic. Sorry. Thank you. Sandy Benico from Graves Road. I don't understand if we're voting to pass over it or voting for it. So could you please clarify? The motion is to pass over. Correct? Yeah. So this is a vote to pass over the question. Anybody else? I'm opening voting. Five seconds. We voted to pass over Article 5, 110 to 4. Article 6. So this is going to be a little bit longer than many of the other ones. I move that the town borrow $170,000 for paving a section of Sheldon Falls Road. And to meet this appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the Board of Selectmen is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to chapter 44, section 7.1 of the general laws or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town, therefore provided, however, that any bonds issued pursuant to this vote shall mature in not more than 15 years from their date of issue. Well, in the motion that I have, it says 15. So maybe, Ross, could you address that difference? This gives the treasurer collector the latitude to, to pick the best bond and the best period. The intent is it would be much shorter, but the motion is to give her the latitude to pick the best financial deal for the town. Yes, but it's the motion that counts. The motion was read at 15 years. The, the, the motions will all be slightly different than the warrant because the warrant leaves a lot of flexibility when it's initially written. The motion is what counts. So I'm going to back up a little bit because this sentence was not written by an English teacher. <laughs> that any bonds issued pursuant to this vote shall mature in not more than 15 years from their date of issue, excluding the term of any notes that may be issued in anticipation of the issuance of any such bonds, such borrowing to be contingent on the passage of a proposition two and a half debt exclusion ballot question. And this requires a two thirds vote. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? Gary Fenton, Roaring Brook Road, Conway. Uh, just where is this being done? And, 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 and a really off the record question is can we but pave Sheldon Falls Road in Buckland? <laughs> it is certainly true that Buckland is helping Conway look good. Uh, so, so for the last three years, the highway department is trying, has tried to get a grant to pay for this paving because the state refuses to increase their Chapter 90 funding despite all of the begging of all of the towns 
they don't do that. And we don't get enough Chapter 90 funds to pay for our road maintenance. Mm -hmm. And some of our roads then go way longer than we feel good about if in between when they get repaired. And so this is for one mile. Ron originally wanted to do two miles for 340,000. And this is for just one mile, the worst one mile, as, as this road goes up and over Dill Hill. If, if you, you know, it turns off of, you know, it turns up Dill Hill, it, it goes by Dr. West's house and the, and the horse farm up there, comes down the other side of Dill Hill. So there's one mile of road that Ron feels is the worst. A lot of that road is in the, is in, um, the shade most of the winter. Uh, it, it has a lot of melting that soaks down into the road and then gets destroyed by the freezing that occurs in the afternoon and at night. And so this is, this is what it costs to pave one mile of road in Conway. If I could just, just add a little bit too, that with the, the grant program uh, that, that the town applied for this year was through MassWorks that administered by the Department of Transportation. One of the categories that they have added to that grant for towns to qualify for funding uh, of the road is that the, the number of minutes and incidences that your emergency services vehicles were not able to use the road due to its bad treatment. And so, um, you know, that, that you know, when, when, when the amount that you're given from the state, Chapter 90 funding pays for two or three miles Year. Your roads last 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. The miles of roads that we had, the math just doesn't work. And you know, may, maybe, maybe what Buckland's doing or other towns are doing is edging closer to that point where you can say your ambulance can't make the trip. Um, but, but if we wanted to skip to the front of the lip, that line, we would have to endanger the residents on that road by not being able to reach them in the, uh, with our emergency services. So. Um, that's that's how that's what it's come to. Shirley Pelletier, Orchard Street. Um, I frequently go over that road, and my question is: noticing how the ice melt works on that road, will this repair include drainage work? Because if it's just repaved. It isn't going to be worth the effort. Ron, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, the um, the hundred and seventy thousand dollars is just for reclamation and paving. The town will be doing drainage work before that happens, and then we'll be finishing up with the edges after it's paid, but this money is just for the cost of the reclamation payment. And Steve Thomas again. Um, let me get my tongue in my cheek here. I ride a motorcycle and go over that section of the uh, Shelton Bowles Road and uh, um, loosen up teeth big time. I mean, let's keep Auckland Road out of this. But, uh, I think it needs some attention. Robert Baker, Elm Street. I do agree that road is in terrible shape and it needs to be repaid, but my question is this. Normally, under normal circumstances of a highway budget, your road repair work is taken out of Chapter 90 money. I guess my question is how come we aren't using Chapter 90 money on it this year? And as we talk about Chapter 90 money, how much money did we get this year for Chapter 90 money? And where is our money being spent? Ron Sweet. Chapter 90 money we get, I think this year was 260. Motion in your mouth. This year we're being allowed 262,000 and change for Chapter 90 money. Um, going through hoping that we were going to, in the last three years, hoping that we would secure the Mass Works grant. We have other roads that we had planned to move forward with. Church here, part of, half of Church here, 
South Church here Road is one of them, which is more probably worse than Shelton Falls Road is. Um, and then we got paving that we did um, previously that we need to seal the top, put a top coat on, and that's where Chapter 90 money is being spent. We're trying to keep our roads up. Um, just to clarify that that $170,000 is only going to do from New Hall Road to about Casey Road. Um, it, it's not including the other side down by Pine Hill, which is also in need. So we'll be looking into maybe the following year with Chapter 90 with that. If, if, but I was asking for the to be able to do that whole section, because that really is the worst section of Shelman Falls Road. One quick Gary Fendig, and just, I do ride bicycles, I don't know if any of you other than motorcycles. That road is absolutely treacherous right now, and please pass this. Someone's going to crash and have a very bad accident on that road, so thank you. So this would be a great issue for people to talk to their state rep and state senator about. This has to do with state funding. Um, just like Bob said, normally we only spend Chapter 90 money on all of this road repaving. But as you can imagine, here it is, 170000 to do one mile of this road, and Ron gets 262000 to do all of his repaving. Now in Conway, we have close to 50 miles of road, and he tries to repave them all every 10 years. So that means we need to repave five miles of road a year. It doesn't sound like that much but it's expensive. And we don't get enough Chapter 90 money to do it. And the state, every year, refuses to raise their Chapter 90. And I can tell you that most of the towns around us borrow money every year to pave their roads. This is a first for Conway. So you know, I'm hoping we're not back here asking you for more money next year. Uh, but many towns borrow money every year to pave their roads. Who'd like to vote on this? I'm an old voting. Okay, our Article 6 was a two-thirds majority, and that passed easily, 110 to 9. Article 7. I move that the town transfer 150000 from free cash to the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund. We have a motion and second on the floor. To move 150,000 from capital improvement stabilization fund for free cash. Any discussion? Want to vote? Oh. Gianna, I this. I'm just curious. Why are we taking out money for the roads when, if there's money, it's available? I would say because we do this every year. We, we do try to keep our stabilization funds uh, uh, healthy, and it requires a two-thirds vote to get the money out of the stabilization funds. And so this is saying, if we really need this money in the future, 
we have the choice of spending it, and we have it as free cash right now. Mary McClintock, right now, the right down the hill. I'm, sec I'm sort of saying that question again. We are borrowing money and paying interest on $170,000 while we are have $150,000 in free cash that we're putting into capital stabilization. It, it, I don't understand. I, I will attempt to answer that for you because you're asking a very logical question. To Bob's point, it is good to keep money going back into stabilization. Stabilization is one of your long-term savings accounts. The borrowing makes sense because our debt, overall debt is coming down. That was actually shown in the handouts you have where the debt level is going down. Contrary to where you may manage your own personal expenses, where you try to minimize debt, the Department of Revenue actually encourages the town to keep a certain debt level. That way, it indicates you're still investing in your infrastructure, whether it be building repairs, new vehicles, or road repair. So this is sort of following DOR suggested guidelines, is to keep your debt level at a reasonable level. I believe your debt level is at a reasonable level. The pain for this debt service is worked into your budget you've already approved and can be tolerated. Possibly next year, it would make sense that if there's additional pro road projects to be paved, to use free cash. But they've allocated a, most of your free cash this year to other projects. And if, if they had taken the money, instead of putting the 150000 in your stabilization, you wouldn't build your savings account, and you wouldn't have, um, or you wouldn't have other projects. So it's a case of getting all those other projects done, as well as getting the road done. Five seconds. Article seven passes one hundred eleven to ten. Article eight. So here is our truck article for this year. I move that the town transfer two hundred and twenty thousand from the capital improvement stabilization fund for capital improvements as follows. For the highway department, a 220,000 $220, to replace a six wheel highway truck and this requires a two thirds vote. The motion and a second. I think you understand the, the article, the motion, any discussion? Shelburne Falls Room. Uh, two questions. What year is the truck and how many miles are on it?
go. Joel Stragowski, Cowboy Mask. Does replace imply trading in the old truck or are we keeping the old truck? It was planned to be traded in. Now it's time to embarrass myself again. <laughs> My name's Hank Horstman, I live up the road. Uh, and, and if you probably remember my, my question, it was to uh, what makes more sense? To trade it in or to put it out for a bid? Or a bid or an open sale or whatever, however you want to look at it. Whatever's going to make the most money, that's all I'm getting at. I, I, I've always heard that it's just a trade-in. No, it's just a simple question. The reason we trade-in is because then it makes sure that the truck disappears and doesn't hang around afterwards. That's the reason why it's always been done that. Well, last one, uh, on up now on our old farm, I think it would be a Smith kid bought that one, so it wasn't traded in. I think it was sold out right to the Smith board. Actually, the town did not have anything to do with that sale of that truck. That truck was traded in. It was he, he bought it through the dealer that um, did the sale of the new truck. The town was not involved in that sale at all, other than the fact that um, I did negotiate a price with the dealer for trading on that. And we ended up getting $12,000 for that truck, which if it hadn't, if I hadn't found a buyer for it, we would have been um, in the $5,000 range. Over here, we got one up here. Jim Pinteria. Uh, what's the repair cost? So it passes inspection, and what are the yearly maintenance and repair costs on this truck going forward? Is it going to surpass the $220,000 purchase cost? Well, one of the biggest problems with the truck now is that parts are not available. So simple little things like uh, light switches and things like that that are special to the truck are not available. So it means spending a lot of time jerry rigging things so that they pass, you know, so they work. And all you, you'll find it with all new trucks now, or all trucks now, that they have about a 10 year life of parts from the dealer. And depending on the truck, aftermarket parts used to be pretty normal for most trucks, but when you get into um, certain brands, they were specialty to their own truck. Um, Ford is one of them that have a lot of specialty parts for themselves. Uh, Peter Jeswell, the truck is 32 years old and it's got nearly 200,000 miles on it, is what I understand. I think it's time to move it on. Dana Goodfield. Dana Goodfield, show up. Uh, Bart right Wolf Ferry. Uh, I don't think there's any question that the truck Ron's talking about getting rid of is well past its, its useful life. Uh, all you've got to do is go look at it. My concern is the amount of money that we are spending for these trucks. Uh, some of you know me. I've been in the business all of my life, not heavy duty trucks, medium light duty cars. But I spent a couple hours yesterday on the phone calling three heavy duty truck dealers. I wanted to know what was the kind of ballpark price that towns were spending on trucks. Um, the first two dealers that I spoke to were pretty much in agreement that it varied from about 140000 
to 180,000, depending upon uh, sophistication of the truck. These trucks now that are being bought have, you know, pretty advanced hydraulic systems on them, uh, electronic controls for the amount of sand and so forth that are spread. The third person that I called, and I not realized this until I started talking to him, just happened to be the salesperson that sold the Celeste too. Now, I will tell you, I was born at night, and as you can tell by looking at me, it was not last night, but I certainly know a sales pitch when I get it. And I had a sales pitch on why we should be spending the kind of money we are for these trucks. And I've got to tell you, it does not make sense. In order for me to support this truck and purchase, and I would, I think there's got to be an amendment for a lesser amount of money. We do not need to spend this kind of money, and mainly because, and I know Ronnie, you won't agree with this, we don't need three trucks of the size that we bought for the last two. Actually, this truck is uh, a different truck than the last two. It is a lesser truck. It is, um, a a two-wheel drive truck that will only have a four, uh, power angle plow on the front, no wing plow. It will not be four-wheel drive. But the cost of everything that's changing is the reason why it's up at 220. The, it, it also includes, this truck will be the same as the others as far as a forklift, but it will also be include a dump body and a sander for it. Now, just the dump body is about $16,000 by itself, and a sander is $25,000. It doesn't take long to get up to the numbers of the 220. Um, there is plenty of other towns that are spending 235 to 275 on buying their trucks. Um, I don't. I, did a lot of research in what I'm specking out for the truck. It's specked out for the, what we need for this town, with the exception that I would, personally, I feel the town could do with a 10-wheeler like we had in the past, but I'm quite sure that the townspeople wouldn't go for that. So I kind of stayed away from that part. Um, we do a lot of our own hauling of sand, stone, and our, a lot of our materials we use on the road, so the trucks need to be in good shape too for that kind of um, operations. Uh, Peter Jeswall, uh, some of you know that I've worked with on the uh, garage building committee with Ron and other people, Hank as well. Um, and I can attest to meeting after meeting that Ronnie has an eye for your pocketbook. And I trust his judgment, and when he says he's done his research and this is what it costs, I trust him that that's what it costs, because I've seen it in action, in helping us get the price of the garage buildings down below what anybody thought was possible. Dave Potter, Roaring Brook Road. Um, a couple of, couple of things. Back a few years ago, I was on the Capital Finance Committee, and actually a couple of people have brought this up. And what we did was we designed a program for vehicles to be replaced with a maintenance program. You can't replace a vehicle on a standard year process without a maintenance program. That has all been designed. I don't know what happened to it. But 10 years is the magic number. And we had engineers um, involved and um, 
you know, this thing of just randomly replacing vehicles um, just doesn't work. Want to vote on this? When we're, as far as voice voting goes, if we're going to move a question, we can voice vote. We're changing that. But if we're voting on an article because we have this and we need to know how it works, we need to do that, just explaining to everybody. But you're ready to vote on this article, I take it. And it needs two-thirds, that's correct. I, I never heard a movement. He moved? Okay. Mrs. Recourse sent, seconded it. I guess we're going to vote on it. Yes, can you voice vote? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Like you do. All right, we're going to vote on our plate. Ten seconds. Okay, Article 8 passed by two thirds, 88 to 23. Article 9, I move that the town transfer $41,300 from free cash for current year Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School tuition and transportation. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Marcus McLaurin, Churchshire Road. Um, why is this here and not in technical schools? I understood that technical schools was labeled as technical schools because it was to be encompassed of any technical school, no, that, as opposed to like Franklin County Tech. No, we're part of the Franklin Tech. Yeah, but we're not part of Smith Vogue. Uh, no, Tom's but if we send a student to Smith Vogue, then that comes out of the town. But that was I, I remember in the past year specifically, it went up a lot, and the question came out, well, why is it going up? It was like, well, because the Smith Vogue. Is, is in this one. And, and this is not a recurring expense. This is a one, one year. This is not, this depends entirely on what student registers. Yeah, registers. it changes every year. So, right. So, I'm just curious, like, why move there? Because it used to be included in technical schools. Exactly where it come, where it is in the budget, I can't answer that, how it was in the past. Sorry. Uh, my, uh, this was my question, and it appears to me that the issue is that this is about a current year tuition and transportation. This isn't for the coming 
budget cycle. This is for like like they're in kid school right now, and that sort of makes sense to me why it would be separated out from the technical schools plural section in the budget, which typically covers any technical schools, including Frontier and um, Smithboat. So is the issue, is it is it here in the warrant? It's sort of like, you know, paying a bill from this year that we didn't get covered before. Is that the issue or what? what is that? I'm guessing here. I'll try to answer that. Um, this is to cover the next school year, the FY22, which is what this whole warrant is. Right? That's why it says, maybe confusingly, current year. The Smith Vocational is not Conway's normal vocational school, and this is to address a specific student and a specific need. So it's a one-off versus being put in with the Article 2 that included all the schools. It's the one-off issue, and that's why it's pulled out. Unfortunately, I don't believe the town has a lot of vote on this because the state mandates that we have to pay this if this student goes there. But it does show up as a separate warrant article. Okay. I believe if you vote no on this, we'll still have to pay the money and find it somewhere. They take it out. They take it out. Yeah. Any other discussion? Vote. Article 9. Voting's open. Five seconds. Article 9 passes. 103 to 6. Article 10. I move that the town transfer $24,841 from the Ambulance Receipts Reserve Fund for a partial payment for Ambulance Department Operational Expenses. Article 10 has a second. Any discussion? Explanation? Let's vote. Voting's open. Five seconds. Article 10 moves 110 to 1. Article 11. I move that the town transfer $20,000 from free cash to the OPEB trust fund. We had a brief discussion of what OPEB was earlier. Good. I got a second on the motion. Can I have an explanation? So OPEB is, is money that we're expected to put aside in a fund by the state so that in the future we will have enough money to pay our, uh, for it's, it's, uh, it's post-employment uh, benefits. And so in other words, so, and, and this is more something the state is requiring us to do. And, you know, I, what I, what I believe is that Conway never has a problem when paying its post-retirement benefits, but larger, really large towns do get in trouble where they don't save enough money to pay their future retirement benefits, and then and then they go bankrupt, or they, you know, then, then so. But to, in small towns like Conway, it's a very small percentage of, of the cost of running our town, and we've never had an issue of paying it. But the state is requiring everyone to put money aside for these future benefits. And so we do. And now and then we spend that money. But Any other discussion? I'm opening and voting.
Five seconds. Article passes 109 to 3. Article 12. I move that the town transfer $15,290 from free cash to the general fund for a retroactive pay raise for the town employees for fiscal year 2021. We have a motion and a second. Explanation? So last year, at last year's town meeting, you may recall uh, that we asked, we asked all our employees to take a uh, wage freeze. Actually, we didn't ask them. There was really nothing consensual about it. We just didn't put it in. Um, but the, the, and, and so at, at the time, the, the, we were facing worst case scenarios for this budget year. Um, we, were, they, we were being asked to prepare budgets by the state to, uh, what would look? What, what would a 10% cut in state revenue? What would a 20% cut in state revenue look like? And it, it, it was pretty desperate. And so, at that time, we felt that we had no uh, uh, no alternative but to but to re re require a wage freeze from, and as well as freezes on spending, current accounts, and everything else. Um, it turns out that that ended up not being necessary, and um, that. We're here and our finances are much better than was predicted at that time. And so, but, but, but there may be a point in the very near future when we're going to need to require a wage freeze again. And it's important that we keep faith with our, with, with our town employees and that, um, uh, you know, that they believe us next time. <laughs> so, uh, and, and part of that is acknowledging that it didn't need to be done. So this is try, us trying to right a wrong to some extent because they were asked to share pain that others were not. And so um, we're trying to make it right. Stein, find um, Shelburne Falls Road. What percent uh, per, I mean, this is a, a number for, I don't know how many employees, what percent increase does this represent? So this was two and a half percent. Uh, Bill Como, Bart Bells Ferry Road. I'm wondering uh, what we passed in uh, Section A, Article 2, where it mentions salary, wages, and so forth. And it shows additional, looks like additional money for salary and wages. How does this, how is this related? So that, that reflects a two and a half percent entry, uh, increase for next year. This, this, the one that we're talking about now is retroactive for last year. could be heard if I wanted to. I'm Howard Boyd and I live up the road. I commend the Select Board Finance Committee for taking the high road here and doing the responsible thing. A lot of companies, private companies, held people's benefits and had some of the best years they've ever had through this whole COVID thing. I think this is well deserved and I think it was a good thing to do. Thirteen. I move that the town transfer fourteen thousand 
$923 from free cash to the general fund for partial debt service for the highway garage. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Let's vote. I hope while we're all here, we all go up and visit the town garage. If you haven't looked at our town garage lately, it's a work of art. Five seconds. Article 13 is moved. 103 to 5. Article 14. I move that the town transfer $5,000 from free cash to the general fund for a partial contribution to re no, 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 no. for a partial contribution to the recertification of property values. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Robert Baker, Elm Street. I guess my question here is, it seems like every year, almost every year, we're asked for funds for this recertification stuff like this. Why isn't this just built in their budget? Instead of putting, keep being put out as a separate line item. I don't understand that. Everybody knows that every so many years, the assessor's office has to have increases for recertification or reevaluations. Why isn't it just put into the budget? Malcolm Foss, Troops Road, I guess I'm the only sufferer here from the assessors. But every three years we have to have a recertification of our property. And this requires somebody, and we get mileage for the vehicle, of going around to every property in the town of Conway and take pictures of it and go inside if it's necessary to keep us up to date what the condition of the property is. And that's what it's all about. Thank you. We, we used to do it in a very uneven way, and every three years we'd come to the town and ask for, you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars for recertification. And so, Bob, this is our attempt at doing it exactly the way you would like it, except we don't include it in the operating budget. Why we, we put it in the operating budget? I, I don't know. We have an agreement that $5,000 and up for non-recurring operating go to uh, become a, a special warrant, that's why. Article 14 passes 105 to 4. Article 15. I move that the town transfer $5,000 from free cash to the general fund as a partial contribution to replenish the grant match fund. We have a second. Motion and a second. Anybody? So, so a few years ago, we set up a fund so that generally the selectmen would have some money to put towards matching grants. And so this is replenishing money that we spent last year to keep that fund up. We put about $5,000 in that fund, and, and if it turns out we don't need it, we don't have to ask for it, but it's, it's just to replenish this fund so that we'll have a little pool of money for matching grants. for grant programs that we want to apply for. Anybody else? Bob? 
how much money is in our grant plan now without this $5,000 added to it? Thank you. Right now, the balance in the grant fund is zero. It's so already 5000 was spent this year. Anybody else? Let's vote. So. Five seconds. Our 15 passes, 107 to 2. Article 16, I move that the town transfer $2,707 from free cash to the field library to help ensure its accreditation. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Let's vote. Five seconds. Article 16 passes 108 to 1. Article 17, I move that the town transfer uh, $3,775 from free cash to the general fund to pay a prior year's assessor's bill for a software subscription. And this requires a four-fifths vote. 80%. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I guess uh, Roxanne Perrin, South Church. I guess this is the one I wanted to speak to, where I understand there was a glitch in the program, and many of our evaluations went up for no reason, apparent no reason, that I can find. And um, they don't know how to address it and correct it. So mine went up $22,000 for no reason. The valuation did. And I'm trying to address that with the assessors, and I can't seem to get anywhere. And I'm sure other people in town, their evaluation went up. And it suppose it was a glitch in the program, so I can't understand why we're paying for this program or and how to correct it. But, but this is for paying a, a software subscription cost that we should have paid last year, but we didn't. It not, has nothing to do with your assessment. <coughs> Or the glitch in the program? I guess I'm the assessor that's in the barrel. It's not, of course, a true troll. But there's a whole new program for the assessment the state had developed. And we had to become involved in it, which cost some money. And the bill didn't get paid last year. And now, Roxanne, I know you're pretty frustrated and you can't, haven't got anywhere. But I hope you understand what the situation is with the assessors. Lee Whitcomb's son-in-law is nearly dead with cancer. And 90% of her time is being spent in Dalton. So that leaves us two. My wife is not very good. And so I'm 88 years old, so I'm not as effective as I was 20 years ago. So that leaves Russ French. And I got God, I think we're trying to do the best we can with what we got. Our secretary is, re is retiring, and it'll all come together eventually. And nobody has picked you up as the lone person that is paying more taxes than what they deserve. Thank you very much. Well, I have a question. When my valuation goes up, and I'm charging it, and when I have to pay an extra $800 in one year, I have a question about it. I have concerns. And I'm having a hard time dealing with the assessor's availability in town. And that's my problem. 
Anything else on the article? Jerry Blanc, uh, Main Poland Road. I just want to suggest that perhaps the glitch in the program is because it needs an update, and if you don't get your subscription for a piece of software, you might not get the updates and the fixes that would correct a problem like that. So paying the subscription cost for the software is probably the best way to get where you want to go. Anybody else? Let's vote. It's open. Five seconds. Seventeen carries, one hundred to six. Article 18. I move that the town transfer $1,065 from free cash for prior year town office supply expenses. This also requires a four-fifth vote. We have motion and a second. Any discussion or explanation? Five seconds. Her clay team passes one hundred to four. Article nineteen. I move that the town transfer $570 from free cash for prior year Board of Health payroll expenses. Again, this needs four fifths vote. We have a motion and a second. Yes, sir. I see $1,065. Nineteen. Anybody else? Let's vote. Five seconds. Article 19 passes 106 to 1. So now we're going to get into a few longer articles. But we're well past halfway. I move that the town authorize the select board to acquire in fee simple by purchase with CPA funds allocated by successful vote of Article 23A for an amount not to exceed $2,800, the appraised value of said property, a parcel of land owned by Judith Waldo, which address is zero Shelburne Falls Road, and more particularly described as follows, assessor's map 410, lot 26.5, for the public purpose of the South River Flood Resiliency Project. And this would require a two-thirds vote. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I believe we have some information coming forward.
Thank you, I'm Mac McCoy on U Hall Road. Now I'm a relatively new member of the Open Space Committee. I'm standing over here with other Open Space Committee members who wanted to speak generally to these four warrants uh, about acquiring property and why we feel it's important to urge the town to do so. Uh, we also, uh, Joe from the Planning Board, is uh, going to answer questions that come up. So as a group, we'll answer. We also have Nick Miller, he's a fluvial geomorphologist, that is otherwise known as a river scientist. Uh, he's worked on uh, technical aspects of the South River for the past 10 years, so he's extremely familiar with what we have. Um, our committee's been working to update the open space recreation plan that's done every five years, qualifies the town for impactful grants, and we want to mention that input from town citizens is critical for that. Uh, we have the open space and recreation survey that's on the table out there. Please grab it, please respond to it before June 15th when it ends. It's very important and that input goes into these questions about how the town will work on trying to deal with flooding and erosion on the South River. So regarding these warrants, uh, we wanted to mention first recognize the high value of the South River to the town. It's a remarkable asset, one of the most prominent features in the town, uh, and a great source of scenic and recreational value, of course. Also, to recognize the negative impacts that the river can have, uh, witnessed by everybody in the last any number of uh, 10 years or so, mainly flooding and erosion, which has the potential to be severe, uh, directly affecting homes in the village as well as valuable farmland, also damaging the scenic value of the river. Uh, we're witnessing the impact of climate change right here in Conway in regard to this, and that's why these four properties have been identified for purchase by the town, so we have greater flexibility to take steps to minimize damage from flooding and using nature-based solutions. The most visible mitigation effort already completed in 2019 is the South River Meadow, that's also known as the Rose property, downriver from Main Street. Uh, it was a three-year project, which provided tremendous value to the town, including educational value that the grammar school is involved with and is embraced using that property. Uh, so Conway is uniquely positioned, due to quite a bit of work over the past 10 years, to qualify the town for favorable matching grants to undertake these kinds of purchases and projects. In fact, Conway is seen as a leader among uh, towns in the state for this kind of initiative and working with these programs. The primary state partner program is the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, or the MVP. Conway has already qualified and obtained MVP funding for the purpose of helping towns become climate resilient and to promote environmentally sustainable approaches. So the MVP funding match for the acquisition of these properties is a one to three ratio. So that means for every dollar that Conway spends, there's, uh, the state is providing three dollars towards the purchase. And the properties on the warrant have been identified years ago, actually, as critical locations in the long-term agenda to address serious flooding and erosion concerns. So essentially, we're looking at this as a prudent investment in town infrastructure and adaptation to avoid higher costs in the future from events related to climate change and other. Uh, so I'll end to remind you that the materials were spread out on chairs. Many of you are looking at them. If you don't have one, they're on the table before you leave, along with the questionnaire I mentioned before, please be sure to have one. It's interesting information. So I'm going to hand it over to Joe to talk about the finances at this point. Thank you, Matt. I'm filling in for Tom Hutchinson, but I don't have a Tom Hutchinson hat, so bear with me. Um, these next three, four articles from Article 20 down to Article 23B are all related to the project that was just described. Um, the selectmen have chosen to make a motion for the appraised value, and part of the logic is that that is a number 
but the town could acquire the property by eminent domain. We had actually anticipated the appraisals would be higher, so um, we're in a little bit of a difficult spot. The other reminder is that this is our matching grant. So if we do not approve these articles, we cannot continue working on the river until we find another source to match the 25%. So there, the motions will be made at the appraised value for the articles 20, 21, and 22, but the funding will come partially from article 23. So we need to pass all four articles for this to be a successful venture for the town. And I can answer any questions. There are any at this time. I could probably say this out loud. Uh, I hate to admit ignorance of language, but what is being said? They can't hear you out in the hall. Oh. Can't hear me in the hall? Okay. What is P simple? P simple is just a simple deed. Or, um, just a just a simple sale. More complicated. Gary Fenton and I am also an attorney, but I'm not charging for this. But <laughs> fee simple, it, it is that simple, but it basically means that you are buying property and you, free of all liens, encumbrances, and the person that's selling it is the true owner. There are other kinds of deeds you can get, but everything that you guys own for any kind of property you're buying is fee simple. That's just a legal term. I'm going to take up a few minutes here, and then I'm going to go home. Because I think what you're doing is the most foolish thing that any people could ever hope to do. There's a much simpler remedy for this, but people don't want to listen to it, so they don't want to pursue it. If it would restore the dam up on the edge of this flat and make it a flood control project, then you could control the water that comes to the center of town. I mean, it, so I think Joe's the one that said, well, they got beavers in there. Well, beavers can be trapped and relocated. And the worst thing for a town is to have a beaver dam above the town, because they do fail. And in the future, if you really wanted to spend some money, put a pipeline from there down in the center of town, now you got something to offer the town. But I've been to his river studies, and he told me one time that the river runs straight from Asheville to Conway. Must have had a lot of hard water and to get up over them some of them hills. Anyway, uh, I know the property, I know what you're gonna do. It used to be my brother's land, and if you dumped a few loads of rock over the gosh darn rail by a lot by Harrison and Harrison's old farm, and nobody's ever looked at the end of my house to see how close the riverbank is to the road. The only person that ever took any interest in it was O'Rourke when he first became Slickman. And he and Bobby Baker, the road boss, went over there and put tape on it. My concern with that is not my house. I'm concerned with the driver for the town, a new driver, crowding the snow, and he's going to be bottom side up in the river and probably dead. So I, I, <laughs> and the other problem I have is you're spending every nickel for there that's in the CPA fund to satisfy you're a little quins, and that's not what it's meant for. Janet Chase is blowing money like the right and left out of that fund. Made top of the million there. And you know, you're still doing it. The last project you had, I could pee more water than what goes into that little recession you made down on Rose's field. And I just don't understand your, your theory. But no matter what you do, you run the water this way and that way, you still gotta go and eat the bridge. And you're taking a piece of property that is a good piece of property for the town to, to have somebody move in and have a store there or make a parking lot there. And I just, I can't stand it. I gotta go home. Thank you, Malcolm. Robert Baker. I guess my question here is we're on Article 20 to start with. 
And I don't think the townspeople really know what you guys are planning here. Because number one, to me, Article 20 is about the project is down on the Shovel Falls Road by the um, landing area where we draw water off of. Um, and that, and Article 21 also is for that. And Article 22 is for a different project above the bridge area. So I don't think you have them labeled very well but for the under taxpayers in this community to understand what you're talking about. And you want us to vote for the praised value of a piece of land. We don't even know what the praised value is. We haven't got it listed anywhere. That's my question. If you're going to vote money, the taxpayers out there know what your money, kind of money you're voting for. The, excuse me. Bob, the appraisals were not available at the time the warrant was generated. The, these are not. generated months ahead. You I have them now? I can give you the numbers. They're why going why haven't you done, put that in your conversation then? Well, I'm trying to explain the scope of what we're trying to do. The selectmen are making motions at the appraised value, but I can give them to you. But the first project you're referring to, Article 20 and 21, it's $2,800 for Judith Waldo's parcel, and Mary Bye's parcel is $3,700. These are unbuildable lots. Uh, one of the reasons we had trouble with the appraisals, they are shown on the town GIS map as one parcel. It turned out they were two parcels. We've been sorting out the deeds and trying to straighten all of these things out. Mary, I believe, is in the nursing home at this time. We had trouble communicating with her. It's not been an easy road, but you're right. Those two are related. We, the plans going forward would include putting in a dry hydrant for the fire department. I discussed that with you earlier in the year. Um, and then the Article 22 let's see, uh, is what we call the um, Evans Lot 69 Main Street. Parcel goes on both sides of the river. It was originally deemed a uh, legally non-conforming lot. It turned out that the land under the river is counted as part of the land. So it was two parcels. It's been put back into one parcel. It is now a legal four-acre back lot, but it's a legal building lot. I'm not sure that the placement of the septic system and the foundation are legal, but the lot is a legal building lot, so it's not a grandfathered lot. So the motions that will be made by the selectmen will be for the appraised value based on the fact that that's what the town could take it for with eminent domain. We have no interest in doing eminent domain, and I believe the select board also has no interest in doing eminent domain. We'd like to offer people not to do eminent domain. There's legal fees involved in that would probably exceed the cost of the parcel. Okay, I, one more question for you. I agree with this, but you're making it a little bit confusing for the townspeople, at least me and me. Maybe I'm getting old and senile, I don't know. If you're going to talk about Article 20 and 21 as the same project, let's talk about them first. We'll talk about Article 22 later when we get to it. Okay, let's let's stop mixing them up. Right. Number two is, you said you're going to put a dry hydrant down there. Have you given any thought about who's going to maintain it? And if it's a river project like I've seen in other areas, not so much in Conway, but other areas, where they fill in eventually and somebody has to get in there and dig the hole out to maintain the dry area. We are very fortunate with the one we have on North Poland Road that we don't have to do that because there's two rivers coming together in that one spot and they recreate, they, they, uh, re excuse me, they create a vortex that keeps the hole sucked out. We're not going to have that down there. So we're going to have maintenance issues. And I hope you got that addressed in your in your budget. That's a good question, Bob. So uh, let's talk about uh, 20 and 21. So these are the, the two small lots along Shelburne Falls Road. And uh, there's a few different things going on down there. So if you ever drive down Shelburne Falls Road, yeah, sorry. It sounded loud to me, but it's not that bad. Um, so if you drive down Shelburne Falls Road, you'll probably notice before you get to the dam that there's a lot of erosion along a uh, cornfield. Right? So this is just downstream of these two parcels we're talking about acquiring. 
but this is also part of the area we're interested in doing work on. So uh, it's kind of a multi-pronged approach. We have a few different goals. One of the goals, as has been stated, is for a dry hydrant. There's, at this point, no like legal access for the fire department to get water. And right now, they drive their truck into the river. If we can acquire these parcels, we could have legal access with a dry hydrant that wouldn't require the vehicle in the river. Um, we have hydraulic modeling and design work that uh, the intention of that is to keep this pool open for that hydrant. Um, we've got a geotechnical engineering crew that is working on this project with us. And in the permitting documents and in the uh, construction costs, we will have a maintenance agreement to be able to go in and maintain that pool if it ever needs to be dug out from gravel. That'll all be in there, as well as some funding to, to have that maintenance occur. But in any case, it's a step up from what you have now in terms of firefighting. Another aspect of this project is the continued agricultural use on that field. So there's about four acres of corn. Right now, to get over to that area, there is a uh, stream ford, right actually in the area where the, the fire truck comes in. Um, there's been a lot of erosion on that stream ford. There needs to be uh, you know, some maintenance of that ford in, in order for the farmer just to get over and, uh, and get to his fields. The, uh, the bank along the larger cornfield downstream has been eroding very rapidly, losing about five or six feet a year. And over the past, uh, I think seven or eight years, he's lost about half an acre of that field. So part of the project moving forward would be to stabilize that bank, stop the erosion of that field, and that will ensure that agriculture can, you know, maintain in the future on this on these four acres. I mean, that's not a lot, but you know, in Conway, you don't have a lot of valley bottom, you know, farmland. So I think uh, protecting what you have is important. Another aspect of this project is um, some landslides that are along Shelburne Falls Road. There's a poster out in the hallway, and I think so there were some materials on your chair when you sat down. The, uh, the largest landslide uh, from the top of the failure to the edge of the pavement, it's six feet right now. The, the failure slope is about 115 feet long, and this is a fairly substantial you know, uh, engineering that's going to be required to you know, stabilize that slope so that Shelburne Falls Road doesn't wash out. So going forward, we're, we're looking at all the different benefits and how to balance those. And we've even got into the weeds a little bit with uh, the snowmobile trail, which is going to be rerouted um, around the backside of the Oxbow if that's reconnected. Um, so we've got a lot of people working on this and we're trying to, you know, kind of take care of every little aspect of it. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and uh, maybe I'll hand it to Joe and see what he has to say. I don't have anything to say. I don't, I don't have a lot to say, but just a point of order for on how we're going to get it, by the way. Um, for the last 45 plus years, I've been on the Conway Fire Department as a volunteer. I have pumped literally millions of gallons out of the river at what we all know as the grit pile down there on Sheldon Falls Road. Not once, never once, has a truck driven into the river to do that. Just so you know, we treat our fire trucks pretty good here, and we try to get a good life out of them. We do not drive them into the river. Alex Caswell, Reed Ridge Road. Um, I had a question about how this was read by Bob. Um, Bob, you said the word purchase and you left out fee, gift, or eminent domain on this article. And I wanted to make sure that when you say purchase, that it in fact means that it cannot be taken by eminent domain. 
We have no plans to take it by eminent domain. Thank you. Right. You, if you approve this, you would not be authorizing us to take it by eminent domain. That's that's right there. Anybody else? Janet Chase, I'm sorry Malcolm has left, but I think we should uh, respond to some of his his comments. Um, one was about the, the success of the current project, which is uh, on the uh, former Rose Field, the South River Meadow, and it, it it's not dramatic looking. It looks like it, this is the floodplain restoration project. Um, so it, if you've ever walked there, and we encourage you to, uh, it's not dramatic. It looks like a swale and a dip. But in fact, it has served its purpose. It has filled up, it's filled up seven times in the last four years for serious rainfall. So in fact, that was a good public investment. Um, and what else did Malcolm say? Some well, one thing Malcolm was talking about was the, uh, the old Conway Reservoir site on Eldridge Road. And so it is true, there used to be a large dam upstream of the village of Conway. Um, that property is now owned by Jim Manuel, I believe. Um, anyway, uh, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers gets involved with, uh, you know, flood, flood, uh, flood dams and stuff. I imagine that would be a very expensive project and uh, a lot of research would be, have to be done to see if that would be you know an effective uh, to way to go but uh, but that's not what we're talking about here we're talking about you know little steps we can take little steps that add up to you know making the, the community more resilient so when you have those rainstorms and those irenes you're still going to get some damage, but hopefully it'll be, you know, a little better. And while we're at it, we're, we're really trying to look at the ecology. Um, so one thing that happened on the Rose property uh, was invasive species removal, uh, native plantings. Um, now you have uh, a recreational asset as a town park. Um, so those are all little pieces of it. Another thing that uh, Joe mentioned, which May not, might not be obvious is that the Warren articles are talking about purchasing property that the town will own and that will go as a grant match for future work. One of another future project that we have uh, envisioned is a uh, culvert replacement on Main Poland Road. This is uh, fairly close to the covered bridge. Um, there's a six foot culvert. Um, it's very undersized. The stream crossing itself is at risk of failing in a large flood event. Um, there's also no passage for fish. Um, and so every summer when the river gets really low in the South River, the water gets warm and fish die. And they can't get up to Johnny Bean Brook because of this one culvert that uh, they have no hope of getting up. So one, uh, the current MVP project, we have 100% design for the replacement of that culvert with a bridge um, that is a, like a bottomless arch culvert that meets the state standards for stream crossings. And uh, so if these warrant articles are approved, then work on that culvert can move forward. Sandy Benko, Graves Road. I thought I understood from the informational meeting that no actual tax money will be used to acquire these properties and that it was all coming from the Community Preservation Fund. Can you address how we're paying for this? It's probably my mistake. It, it is your tax money, but it would not affect the tax rate. It's funds that are available. The CPA funding is already in existence. Other funds were from the sale of the old grammar school and from some lumber cutting. And they are what are called special revenue funds. They can only be used for land acquisition or 
those types of events. That money is in the bank. It's been there since 1990 on one of them, and I think maybe 10 years for the forest cutting money. So the money is currently available and would not affect this year's tax rate or future tax rate. Well, we're going to be asking for 50000 from community preservation. Uh, Gianna Megan, this is Nick Pullen Road. I, I would move that we vote on this. You're asking to move the question. 20. The motion, a motion in a second has only been made on 20. So we're, we're up to speed to vote on the first one. I need to know your feelings about moving the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? the question. Let's vote on 20. Five seconds. Article 20, we needed two-thirds majority. We had 91 yes, 17 no, so it, it passes. Article 21. It will sound very similar. I move that the town will authorize the select board to acquire in fee simple by purchase with CPA funds allocated by successful vote of Article 23A for an amount not to exceed $3,700, the appraised value of said property. A parcel of land owned by Mary Bay, which address is zero Shelburne Falls Road, and more particularly described as follows. Assessor's map 410, lot 26.5, being part of the property conveyed to John and Mabel Chesbro, probably as recorded in book 623, page 90, or in book 482, page 54, in the Franklin County Registry of Deeds, for the public purpose of the South River Flood Resiliency Project. And it requires a two-thirds vote. I have a second, so we have a motion and a second. Anybody? Mary? Thanks, it's, I'm Mary McClintock. I'm um, just ending my term on the planning board and ending my term on the community preservation committee. And one of the things that Malcolm raised um, was I think an inaccurate statement about spending a lot of money of the Community Preservation Act money. And it's a little bit weird that we're voting these articles before we're voting CPA requests. But I would like someone to please read us the current num amount of money in each of the CPA funds. There's a general unrestricted part of CPA funds. Then there's a restricted historical preservation, a restricted community housing, and a restricted open space. And I'd like to know what those amounts are. I will, re I will read them in a moment, actually. Although this was as of, okay. So here's what, how much money we have in that Malcolm was expressing concern that the amount of money in, in Article 23, including the $3,700 that's needed for Article 21, here's how much money we have. In historic preservation, our fund balance is $29,134. That, no money from that fund is being requested in any of these projects. From open space and recreation, in open space and recreation, there is 4,103, that's reserved just for open space and recreation. Affordable housing, community housing, that section of CPA money, we have $126,837.
unreserved. We can spend it for any allowed community preservation purpose. $560,466. So when anybody makes a comment about being concerned about this depleting our funds, um, please think of those numbers. Given that Article of Alex Capital reads withdrawal, given that Article 20 and Article 21 are essentially the same article, I motion to move Article 21. He wants to move the question. Right? You want to move the question? Yeah. Good. We have a, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Five seconds. Article 21, requiring a two-thirds majority, passes with 91 yes and 16 no. Article 22, equally long, different parcel. I move that the town transfer the remainder of the Cricket Hill Road Special Revenue Fund and the remainder of the sale of real estate, Chapter 44, Section 63, Special Revenue Fund, as a portion of the cost of the public purpose of purchasing a parcel of land owned by the South River Trust, which address 69 Main Street and more particularly described as Assessor's Map 102, Lots 2 and 2.1, as part of the South River Flood Resiliency Project, and further to authorize the select board to acquire in fee simple of purchase said property. Requires a two-thirds vote. Yeah. We have a second. Yeah. Any discussion? Oh. Bob Baker. My question on this project is, um, this is where you plan on moving the river again? No. No. Are you going to try to get the overflow of the river to go onto this person's piece of land that we're trying to buy, where it normally does not go? The river won't be moved. Well, uh -oh. the, the river the river will be moved. Go ahead. There is an original riverbed located on the Academy Hillside. I understand that. And the intent, uh, one of the intents, is to lower the berm that was put in along the river in 1939, I believe, after the flood hurricane, to allow uh, the rising water to go into that area and follow the old riverbed and then go out underneath the bridge. As part of this work, we did a study of the flow in the river, and it's confirmed, I think, the suspicion of many people in this room that the opening in the bridge is too small. So we can't solve all the problems until we convince the state that the opening in the bridge is too small. But this would alleviate some of that, and I'll let Nick go into more detail. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So we're not talking about moving the river, we're talking about Breaching this 1939 berm, which uh, you know during the winter time, if you stand on the Main Street Bridge and look upstream, you can see it. It's cut granite block. Um, so back in the day before this was built, the South River actually flowed back into that floodplain. We're talking about removing parts of that berm to allow flood water to go back towards Academy Hill Road. What we would need to do is additional hydraulic modeling. We need to figure out, we know the bridge is too small, but we need to figure out how small it is. 
at some point in the near future, MassDOT is going to do another study and they're going to want to replace that bridge. And we want to have some money to do all the modeling so we can tell them, this is the size of the bridge you need to build, and that's part of this project. Breaching this berm would allow water to go back into what is you know, a forested area. It's a low-lying kind of wetland behind Academy Hill Road. But we're not talking about a major engineering effort. Um, this would be a fairly simple project. We hope that that would help to you know, maintain the longevity of the, of the retaining wall that keeps washing out. This is like at least the fourth retaining wall that's been at that spot. Um, so that's all part of what we're talking about here. Additional target for the modeling we would like to do is looking at Pumpkin Hollow Brook itself, and um, you know what are you know how much is Pumpkin Hollow Brook affecting the flooding that's going on in the center of town? Yes, I I understand what you're doing, but have you addressed the situation that happened the last flood in the center of county? When the, when the center of town got flooded down by the library, Elm Street, and Main Street, all the water came down Academy Hill Road to flood the street. And if you're going to send water more in that direction by lowering that burn, if you're not addressing how, you, how the, you're going to stop the water from coming down Academy Hill Road, you're just going to add to the problem and we're going to have more water downtown in a, in a type of flood like we had back then. So the Warren article is talking about acquiring that parcel. So we're not talking about necessarily doing this tomorrow. We would have to do a lot more investigation, and what I'm calling that investigation is hydraulic modeling and survey to try to figure out what's actually going on. So we wouldn't be allowed to, and we wouldn't want to do anything there if, the, if it was gonna make the flooding worse. But if the town can acquire that parcel, it gives you some flexibility to try to address the flooding, you know, in the best way that you know the scientists can figure out how to do it. Uh, Jan yeah, you can, you can say something. Janet Chase, um, related to that, I want to point this is this parcel has been identified for like 15 years as a key location for potential poten whoops, potential mitigation. Um, it's really a long shot as to whether the owner will sell it to us at this price. Um, and uh, if not, then it's going to be rebuilt and this once in a lifetime opportunity to try to slow the river down at this key junction uh, will be missed. So I just, we're not, none of these uh, owners of the land have agreed to sell for these um, prices, just for your information. It is, it is a process. Alex Caswell, Reedsburg Road again. Given that this article is the same as Article 21 and 20, with the exception of the location of where the funds are coming from, and no one is asking any questions about the money, I motion to move this question. Okay. We have a motion in a second to move. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. No. Uh, ayes have it. Sorry. Five seconds.
Okay, Article 22 uh, is successful. Uh, 82 yes, 21 no. Article 23. I move that the town appropriate or reserve for later appropriation monies from the Community Preservation Fund as listed in the warrant with each item considered a separate appropriation. Okay, so we're going to try to vote these as a whole, all of them, and if necessary, we'll go one at a time. So part A, $50,000 from the unbudgeted reserve for expenses for land acquisition at 69 Main Street and two unnumbered, unbuildable parcels along the Shelver Falls Road for costs not to exceed $80,000, the appraised value of the parcels. Part B, 15,000 from the unbudgeted reserve for expenses for a chapter 21E phase two environmental assessment of 69 Main Street. Part C, 45,000 from the housing reserve for a Habitat for Humanity house at 638 South Deerfield Road. And part D, from fiscal year 22 annual revenue, 10% to the Community Preservation Historical Resources Reserve, 10% to the Community Preservation Community Housing Reserve, 10% to the Community Preservation Open Space Reserve, 5% from fiscal year 2021 annual revenues for administration of the Community Preservation Committee, and the remainder to the Community Preservation Budgeted Reserve. And it requires a two-thirds vote. Here okay, we have motion and a second. Discussion? Sandy Benico, Graves Road. Um, I don't understand why we are looking at all of these things as one when they are very unrelated. For example, the community's donation to Habitat for Humanity has nothing to do with the South River Project, and I would like to see these um, A, B, C, and D voted separately. So if we fail to vote all of them together, we'll vote separately? Correct. Or can someone explain why we would include the Habitat for Humanity, um, number C, I believe, with the South River Project? Mary, do you want to go? Hi, I'm Mary McClintock again, um, and I am a member of the Community Preservation Committee, and what the Community Preservation Committee does is accept applications for use of Community Preservation Act money for projects that meet the criteria of what's appropriate for using, legally allowed for using CPA funds. The CPC voted to move all, there were there, these were the, the projects that came before the Community Preservation Committee to ask for funds from the CPA funds. So um, two of those, A and B, relate to the South River project. Uh, the, the third one, the 45,000 from the current, in the current account, 126,000 housing reserve, would be a contribution from the town to uh, work on the Habitat for Humanity house that will be built, uh, plan, on being, plan on being built at 638 South Deerfield Road. The um, a Habitat for Humanity house, that you may or may not know, is a opportunity for um, someone with modest means to um, be, become a first-time homebuyer and have an affordable mortgage. 
So the, um, the, the new owner of that house would be required to take out, I think it's $128,000 mortgage, um, and put in a certain number of hours of labor. There would be funds from donations. There would be a lot of volunteer labor all together to, to create the house. The 45000 that was asked for by the Habitat, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity um, was um, to have funds for things like site work or things that they can't get you know, volunteer labor to do, that, there's, that there ends up being a combination of different funding and in-kind donation of services that creates one of these houses. Um, so that's what this $45,000 request is, and I think the folks from Habitat are not able to be here right now, but that's, that's, um, that's what that part is about. So we haven't heard about that, we've been hearing about the South River, but that's what this piece is about. And um, so that's wearing my community preservation committee hat. I'm taking that off. Now I'm putting on my Conway neighbor hat who works in social services and is very aware of the housing crisis in our communities all over Franklin County, all over the state. And I think that the possibility of having a, you know, a hardworking family um, be able to afford to move into a house in Conway and contribute to the community and provide another great place to live is a fabulous thing. And so as a personally, as a person, I strongly support. I also want to say that we have 126000 in our housing housing reserve fund, and we haven't been able to come up with any uses by the town to support um, housing that is, um, is affordable. So this feels to me like a perfect use of contributing a small amount to a larger project that achieves the goal of um, supporting folks uh, being able to own a home. Yeah. Um, just briefly, I wanted to answer Sandy's question in a, in a slightly different way. This community preservation fund is a separate fund unto, its, unto itself, and um, a certain amount is raised every year, and that dollar amount is matched by the state. It is portrayed on the warrant in this manner, identifying how, how it's going to be used. Everything else is, is set aside. Um, and typically, with the, it does say, with each item being considered a separate vote so that we're not mixing the housing money with the or the housing vote with the river i think it was just proposed in the interest of time to do one vote on all of them stein pike shelter calls road uh, could somebody speak to what d is i think it means that we were agreeing to um with the annual revenue that gets brought in from the community preservation fund to those um, sure, ten how percent how to split up. Is that correct? Okay, never mind. It's statute. Yeah. Nelson Shifflin, Shelburne Falls Road. I believe these are all legitimate expenses um, that would be incurred from funds from the Community Preservation Fund, and this is why the fund was established. I think we should vote <coughs> each of these items uh, as, as one vote, uh, not individually. We have a motion to move the question and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So we're going to vote on this as one. Voting's open.
Five seconds. Article 23 has been approved. You needed two thirds. It was 84 yes and 20 no. Say you want your cent. Article 24. I move that the town authorize the treasurer to spend 15000 from the Medicaid revolving fund to pay related reimbursement fees. I have a second. Motion and a second. Discussion or explanation? What does that mean, uh, Chip Moore Main Street? Anybody else? Let's vote. Five seconds. Article 24 has been has been successful 88 to 1. Article 25. I move that the town amend its general bylaws to change the date of its annual town meeting as printed in the warrant. There's a motion and a second. Does everybody understand that we're, we're town's trying to move this to the first Saturday in June? First Saturday in June. 1 p.m.? I'm the very arduous sir in Skinny Road. I'm just wondering if it makes sense. The people here are voting for this. The people who it's a bad time for can't be here to vote against it. Does it really make sense? Somebody left and said to me, she's in the middle of haying, this is a terrible time. She said, there are lots of people that would be here that can't. And she said, I said something about it, it would be 11 o'clock at night. She said, that's better than on a Saturday. I wonder if there's a way to do a town-wide survey rather than voting, as um, the person in purple said. Nelson Shiflett, uh, still from Shelburne Falls Road. <laughs> so I think this is a great idea. And the reason I think so is because I, it may encourage Members, younger members of our community to attend, who often can't attend when we have uh, meetings in the evening that run until 11 o'clock. Uh, other towns have experimented with providing uh, daycare for, for kids. 
There's other towns have coordinated. I checked into this a couple of years ago. Have coordinated with various sports activities, games in town, and the playing fields, and so on, to make sure that it was simpler for young younger people to attend. As you look around here, I don't think our average age is representative of the average age of people in Conway. Bob Baker, Robert Baker, I guess we can't satisfy everybody in this article. By no means. We're never going to get 100% one way or the other. So I'm asking that we vote on the question now. <laughs> Since Mrs. Recor seconded that, I guess we're going to vote on it. Okay, vote. We can do this with a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes uh, have it. Even I can hear that. Okay, let's vote. Article 25 wins, 53, yay, 33, nay. It passed that close. Article 26. I move that the town amend its general bylaws to rename the Board of Selectmen as the Select Board. And for such purposes to replace throughout the bylaws the word Board of Select Men or Select Men with Select Board, and that's all one word, small b, or and Select Man with Select Board Member. And to authorize the town clerk to make non substantive ministerial revisions to ensure the gender and number issues in related text is revised to properly reflect. Such, such change in title and further to amend the general bylaws by inserting new sections therein as, as printed in the warrant. Second. We have a motion in, in a second. We got to call the question immediately. Okay, we're voting on the call. What's the second? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're voting. Five seconds. Article 26 passes, 73 to 6. Article 27, I move that the town amend its protective zoning bylaws to replace the words Board of Selectmen, where they appear in sections 6-61, and Selectmen, where it appears in section 6-62, with Select Board. 
as printed in the warrant, and as a protective bylaw, this requires a two-thirds vote. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Let's vote. Five seconds. Article 27 passes, 82 yes, 5 no. Article 28, I move that the town amend its protective zoning bylaws as referenced in Article 2 of those bylaws by removing the Fournier parcel, so-called, off Fournier Road, from the solar overlay district and to adopt an amended official zoning map dated February 22nd, 2021, as printed in the warrant. And again, this requires a two-thirds vote. I have a motion and a second. Joe? Um, if we didn't bring the map. Um, it's the parcel behind the school here. Um, it's the whole 57 acres. It was designated as part of the Green Community Act that we would put us we could put a solar system by right on the property. We have since decided to do a forest management plan, and that's inconsistent with solar panels. So we're asking to remove it from the solar overlay district. Anything else? Vote is open. Oh, sorry, Bob Baker. Does that include the four acres that are due outside the store, outside the store that we purchased after? Is that included with it or not? Yeah. Joe says yes. Yes, it does. So if we vote this down, that means you could never put solar in it if you want to add it to the school in the vacant field? No, you can't, you can't do it like that. It doesn't mean that. It means that it would fall under the new proposal by law and would take a special permit. But I cannot envision putting anything on the forest part because we have a forest plant. That, you could still put it on that parcel. That's what I'm asking, the vacant field. Yes. But it's not automatic by right. Anyone else? Let's vote. Five seconds. Article 28 is passed. 87 yes, 2 no. Article 29. I move that the town amend its protective zoning bylaws Article 9, Large Scale Solar Facilities by Law, as printed in the warrant. And I'm not going to read it. <laughs> and being a protective zoning by law, that requires a two thirds vote. I have a motion and a second. Questions or information? Okay. Hi, can everybody hear me? I'm Beth Gershman, I'm the chair of the Conway Planning Board, and uh, here we are with this very lengthy, but last, right? Last article of to this annual town meeting. I'd like to make a few points about this before we start talking. Uh, our existing bylaw was adopted in 
2011. Much has changed in the solar industry since then. When the planning board members made the decision to revise this bylaw, we undertook a process that involved looking very closely at local and statewide existing solar bylaws, talking to other planning board members in neighboring towns, attending webinars and programs on solar siting and solar regulation, and we relied heavily upon the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's 2020 publication, Solar Best Practices Guide, and on the state of Massachusetts' most recent SMART guidelines. SMART is a Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target. We did this thoughtfully and carefully, and we spent many hours working on this proposed revision. The Planning Board absolutely supports alternative energy and Massachusetts's promotion, regulation, and efforts toward increasing alternative energy throughout the state. We found that all Western Massachusetts towns, with the exception of Leiden and possibly Chesterfield, require special permit process for any proposed large-scale solar. Many of our neighboring towns, if not most, have restrictions on size, forest clearing, siting, height, slopes, distance, visibility, and noise. This proposed bylaw re revision means no changes from our current bylaw for either home solar or for any solar array under two and a half acres in size. The Warren article includes the entire current bylaw, proposed deletions as well as additions. We have added a special permit process for anything over two and a half acres in size. We have added several restrictions some definitions, and we've deleted unnecessary or confusing language, and we've changed the order of the bylaw. Uh, we did put a handout on everyone's seat that really highlights the, the major changes that we're asking for. Planning board members believe that these proposed changes are in line with communities of similar size and character. We believe we are walking a delicate balance between private property rights of those who would like to lease a, an appropriate site on their land for large-scale solar facility and the rights of abutters, neighbors, and citizens of Conway. And I welcome your questions. Uh, hi. My name is Phyllis Crane, 320 Bay, Poland Road. We just moved to Conway, actually. I'm not opposed to this. I just have what's really an editorial question. On page 7, under the capitalized term, Solar Overlay District, the last sentence says, large-scale solar installations are allowed as of right in this district with site plan review. Is the phrase large-scale solar installations does it have the same meaning on the same page, one, two, four definitions up, as large-scale ground-mounted solar voltaic installation? Yes. Okay, I would just recommend making that cap term part of the other cap term definition to alleviate confusion in the bylaw. That's my only comment. I'm not opposed to anything. Thank you. Jerry Block, Main Poland Road. Um, my neighbor, who could not be here, asked me to read this because he wanted his statement to be part of the uh, proceedings. Jonathan, Jonathan Barkin uh, of 502 Main, uh, 502 Williamsburg Road, asked me to read this so it was part of the town meeting proceedings. To whom it may concern, my home and property are on Williamsburg Road, close to the next amp installation on Main Poland Road. I'm very grateful greatly relieved to see the proposed bylaw changes that respond to the host of impacts and mistakes that the project made clear to me, some of which remain unresolved. My concern is the absence of strong penalties for non-compliance to town bylaws or documented complaints. To entirely, though entirely out of character for me, I suggest that commercial projects like this must be held to the highest standard and be held accountable. There must be serious and specific repercussions built into any upcoming special permits or leases. A fine of no more than $50, as currently indicated in Section 61, does not do it 
and certainly doesn't motivate timely remediation. Thank you, Jonathan Barkin, 502 Williamsburg Road. Thank you. Joe? Yeah. Okay, I see your hand up, and Kenny, I see um, yours. Just like to respond to that. It is correct that in our zoning bylaw, the fine is $50 per offense per day. It can be assessed on a daily basis. The state law limits zoning bylaws to $300 per day per, per offense. This has been in our bylaws since Christ was a baby, I think. 1979, I think, is when this bylaw was put into effect. And it's been in there ever since. I believe it's similar to other towns, but I didn't research it. Hank Hortzman? Hi, my name's Hank Horseman. Yeah, I'm four miles up the road, six miles up the road, I guess. Uh, this all relates to solar. Is it, are there uh, plans to regulate wind power? Anybody address that? Obviously not. I don't have a problem with it. It's two of them over where my my kid has his business. And I think they're pretty neat looking. And there's a whole bunch of them on a mountain up in New Hampshire where they have their camp. And the man loves to have people come in there and look at them. And they, I don't know, as far as I'm concerned, getting free energy is the way to be as long as it isn't harming anybody or anything. And it's, if you're going to get free energy, because you don't like looking at a windmill, to me, is insane. But you don't have a problem with all the power lines running through all the place. And that's okay, because we've got accustomed to those. Thank you. Okay, um, well, I just, as a citizen, I agree with you. Um, but we are focusing just on this solar bylaw revision. This is something we could certainly take up as a planning board in the future, if people wanted us to. Oh, Joe has a comment. The historian is back. There is a section in our bylaw for a large scale industrial commercial facilities. I don't remember the section number, but it was thought of and partially addressed when we passed that bylaw. It would require, I believe, it would be over 50 acres uh, for that bylaw to go into effect, but it, it does have clauses in it about noise and the effect of the wind. No, no, piece of, you know, the, the, the blade uh, phenomenon, the uh, flicker, flicker it's called, of the blades. Well, and uh, subsonic noise, which is the bumping noise apparently can develop in the earth. So it is partially, but it's not unique to wind direction. Kenny Womack. Uh, first question I had was, what are the complaints they've received on that commercial facility? <laughs> no, I would seriously like to know what the complaints are. No, I understand. Um, so I want to separate the existing project from this proposed revision. It, I, I don't know that we, shall we list the complaints that we've had? I there think probably on behalf of the rest of the citizens, we are not privy to those complaints. We would probably like to know what they are. Okay. Just in general, without Susan Fenton Rohrenberg Road, I'm a member of the planning board. Um, just in general, there have been complaints about noise. There have been complaints about the timing of the construction. There have been complaints about litter. There have been complaints about visibility from the abutters' property. Um, complaints about how the screening is being structured. Um, complaints about water, uh, stormwater management. Um, there, there's just been a long litany of, of issues that were never identified when we first passed this uh, bylaw in 2011. They just weren't, weren't things that people thought about. But now we know more about large-scale solar facilities and how better to be sure that they respect the rights of the abutters and still allow for, um, for, the, for the clean energy to be created. So it's, 
It's just a matter of making sure we have the special permit process, which gives the planning board the ability to say, no, you can do this, but you have to do it this way, and you have to do these things with it, just to be sure that everybody, like you can say, you can't have construction between the hours of um, five and seven on a Saturday morning, for example. I, mean, I, I guess my follow-up to that would be, so are the complaints geared more towards the construction and site and that, or is it towards the fact that there is a solar field there? Is there any complaints about the solar field? The, com the complaints are based on how the field was constructed. Oh, that's, uh, that's and, and visibility. I mean, the visibility of the field, yes, is part of the construction, but the fact that it is solar is not part of the Okay, then I, my next comment would be then in section 8, under the height, shall not exceed 12 feet above finished grade unless a higher rate is necessary for dual purpose agricultural use. And yet, when we go back to residential, and there doesn't seem to be any limit on height. Right. Well, I can tell you as a person who looks at one sitting in the middle of an agricultural field that used to be mowed by a person who just left here, that it is very unsightly. While I completely respect their option to have that, if you're looking at site pollution, that certainly fits the bill. So I question as to whether if you're gonna go in that route where you're looking at something that may be offensive to somebody because of its visibility, maybe you have to look a little bigger. Well, the, the purpose for this particular set of amendments, and I, I hear what you're saying, Kenny, and I'm not crazy about having solar by law, solar that I can see from my field, my house, for sure. Um, but uh, the purpose for these amendments was to restrict the really large scale ones that have the bigger problems associated with them that really affect a lot of the butters and perhaps the community as a whole. So I appreciate your concerns, and perhaps if you want to see that happen in a future amendment, we could take a look at it as a planning board and see if we want to be able to deal with that. My last question would be to the planning board. Were there advertised hearings of this before? Yes. How many? Two. Okay. Were they Zoom or were they live? Zoom. All meetings Yeah. Everything yeah. had to be Zoom. I figured that part. Yeah. Okay, well I just think this is 10 pages of something that this is a town bylaw it should probably be not be held at an annual town meeting, or it should be a separate article. Well, we, we had an information session um, that was pretty well attended, and then we had um, a public hearing that was also advertised, and that was in the paper, and um, any of us, you know, we've been available to answer questions at all of the planning board meetings. So it's, it has been publicized to the extent that we could, given COVID. And Conway Currents, too. Sure. Kate McDonough, North Hill. I just have a question. Um, I noticed under Section 9.3, under Site Control, it talks about um, screening and requiring native trees and shrubs, which I think is very important, but later, The section under animal and plant management, um, it just says seeded with a pollinator mix, which is also important, but it doesn't specify a native plant pollinator mix. And I'm just wondering if that was considered or if it's possible to add that in at this point. So um, uh, that was an oversight, but the nice part about a special permit review is that we can have special conditions, orders of conditions, when we approve the, prop, the, the parcel, we can say that the, uh, the orders of conditions include um, that there have to be native um, species in the uh, pollinator mix. That, that's something that we could do and we'll take a note. Mary, did you have a thought? No, yeah? Right, one of the things about that brings up this issue of the order of conditions. One of the really great values of a special permit process over the current site plan review process is that that kind of issue can get addressed in orders of condition and that people who have concerns about a particular site or a particular project can 
come to meetings, can have their, you know, share their opinions about that. So what I would say is, um, you know, pay attention to if there are, if there is a future solar project, um, come to those hearings, come to those information sessions and express concerns like, okay, we gotta make sure the order of conditions includes X, Y, and Z, including that. Um, Hi, Jerry, Jerry LeBlanc, Main Poland Road. I just wanna say, that I really appreciate the work of the planning board on this, and uh, I'm gonna butter to the next AMP project that's up there on Main Poland Road. And what we found in the process is that the current bylaws are, are woefully inadequate. Um, the the buy right siting, and, and it gives all the power basically to the company and very little power to the town to sort of have a conversation and say, like, what is it, where is it going, and like, what is gonna work, and what is appropriate. So, um, you know, I think that these bylaw changes are all there just to bring us up to date with what's already, what other towns have already found and experienced, which is that the solar companies are out there um, kind of grabbing up land here in the rural part of the state um, in places where it's a lot cheaper and there's, there aren't bylaws, and they're looking for little communities like Conway that don't have much on the books to hold them back. And so we're just bringing this up to date. And what Susan said about the special permit process is, is the crux of this is that it really gives the ability to look at each case and sort of you know, work out the details rather than have a bylaw that tries to fix every little item and, sort of create regulations on every little item, the special permit process does that in a more specific and um, you know, site-specific way. So I think that's you know, what, this, what this bylaw change is about. And uh, I you know, wanna say that how it's affected us in being next door neighbors to this new project, we're kinda like, we've been the canaries in the coal mine and, and we've experienced um, what it's like. And, you know, I know that none of this is going to change the way things are for me, but I'm here speaking, hoping that it'll help the next person or you or any of the people in this room uh, if they come up against a 30 acre forest deforestation project that sort of looks pretty and, and you know on the on the face of it that it's green energy and it's solar but it's a huge loss for our habitat here in conway and for the rural feeling of conway um, i know that i feel a great loss in what i've experienced and that's just to sort of uh, generalize thank you Hi, I'm Devlin Salmon at 2300 Main Polar Road. I'm actually next door neighbors to Jerry and more butters of the solar array as well. We, oh. Um, so yeah, just to kind of go on Ken's question about the complaints. Okay, sorry. I'm a little nervous, sorry. I'm nervous your time. <laughs> so um, it was basically kind of along the lines of what Jerry was saying. Um, when we, we moved to Conway to be in a beautiful rural community, um, we had five acres of land. We were surrounded by woods and forests. We have a beautiful swamp right across the street. We have a lot of endangered species. Um, so basically when I found out that um, the solar area was going to be happening, I tried to talk to our neighbors. Um, but it's just, it's unfortunate that the solar companies are based out of California um, and they really don't understand how important a lot of the land is to us out here um, and they want to make money so that's what this basically was um, the solar company told them to go bigger they can make more money so they went from 12 acres to 30 and it's been pretty devastating um, it's been pretty emotional uh, we have trails in our woods we have children, um, so it's been a pretty big loss, and I just want to really drive that home to people that don't understand because we love nature, we love the animals, they, they work 
A lot of them were wiped out. We had so many deer eating my gardens. I was so pissed off. But, you know, after the construction kind of subsided, the deer haven't been so bad, but it was really infuriating. We could hear the men, you know, building the panels, and they were screaming and yelling and swearing. My kids could hear them. It's just like, we had litter in our van. It's just really annoying. So that's all. Thank you for your time. Bob Baker. Move the question, please. Thank you very much, sir. We have a motion and a second to move the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Five seconds. Article 29 uh, has passed, 7310. And before we adjourn, uh, here's a word from our town clerk. I don't want to keep you here any longer than you want to be here. I just wanted to remind everybody that we have got quite a few openings on boards and committees. And even if you could pass it along to people you know if you're not interested, our Zoning Board of Appeals needs people, the Board of Health, the School Committee, the CONCOM. Um, we can always use election help. Uh, the Planning Board definitely needs help. And I think um, the Agricultural Committee is going to be needing somebody coming up soon. So again, even if you yourself aren't interested in helping out, if you could pass it on, it would be great to get some new blood into these positions. Got one coming. <laughs> this Zoning Board of Appeals, which is important, is important of our agency in this, in this town, if you want to get any kind of a variance or anything to build something on your land, has two members. We have a, a bylaw that says that we have to have three to even have a meeting. So if someone wants to, if any one of you want a variance or something, we need more board members. So it's really simple. We hardly ever meet. We do. And we're a very nice group of people. And we're, it's all, both of us, wherever, wherever Mark is. But really, it's just. I don't know how they do it. Do they call it the select board or whatever their new name right? But please just volunteer and come down. It's it's kind of interesting. Once every couple of months we have a meeting. But please, the zoning board of appeals in particular. Thank you. Okay, once again before we leave, we need a word from Ross. Hey, I just want to thank um, the people helped us set up yesterday, um, Bruce the custodian, the fifth grade class under the direction of the phys ed teacher, Ms. M. You should have seen these kids with their yardstick measuring out the separation. It was fantastic. I've been here for a short time. Uh, this is my first and last town meeting, but I've been really impressed with the professionalism and the dedication of your department heads and your staff and employees for the town of Conway. You have a good bunch of people helping run this town. I want to thank the select board for their faith in me. And it's been an honor and a privilege and really fun to work with a lot of you and to hear all of your input. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. Yep. Okay. I've been instructed to read this. Move to adjourn this town meeting until Thursday, June 10th, 2021, to the town hall between the hours of 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. to bring in their votes for various town offices and to vote the following question related to borrowing 170 
$1,000 for the paving at section of Shelburne Falls Road as printed in the warrant. Second? All in favor? All in favor? 